Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for meeting each and every single one of us, wherever we may be tonight. Lord, I pray that you may just minister to our hearts through the songs, through the word, through the fellowship, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you this evening. And I just pray that we don't take it for granted, that we may just set aside all distractions and focus on you. Jesus, in your precious name I pray. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings Truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place.
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness This is my confidence You've never failed me yet No, you've never failed I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough Keep me still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence 
you've never failed your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never tries to roll over my bones When sorrow tries to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And shame no longer has place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind oh I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance
Amen, amen. Join me in prayer. Heavenly God, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness. As we come here tonight, Lord, sitting in chairs, let us be reminded that we are standing in your love. That everywhere we go, everywhere we are, God, your faithfulness, your power, your spirit, your very life lives in us and through us. God, as we come to this time of sermon and message, would you open up our hearts and our eyes to hear your truth? Help us to know that it is you who are speaking to us, not just ramblings or thoughts that I have in my mind, but God, let my words be words that come from you, that bring us life. Help us to hold on to what is true, to know who we are in you and who you are calling us to be today. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome everyone. It's good to see you guys again. So tonight we are talking about the second part of our sermon series, um, which is all about identity, knowing who we are. And so I wanted to start off tonight um, by having you all imagine a very familiar scene. Take a moment right now and imagine that you were in an elevator or you're walking around or, or maybe you're going for an interview and someone asks you the question, who are you? They want to know who Patty is, who Ray is, who Diane or Edwina or Alanis or Paige or, or who Jess is. They ask you, who are you? How would you answer that? How would you describe yourself? Now, most of us, we might say our names, our ages, our school or our major or what we graduated with or what we're trying to do as a career. Or maybe we talk about our hobbies, the instruments we play or the things that we like to do on our spare time. Usually we answer the question of who are you with a list of things that we do. Our accomplishments, our resume, if you might want to say a different word. We like to present a certain self to people, constantly trying to show that we're worthwhile. What makes us unique? the thing that makes me, me, the thing that makes Jess different from everyone else. And we live in a society where everyone is taught to do that from a very young age. We go into job interviews to sell ourselves, to do these things. But what would happen if tragedy struck? What if all of those things that you named, all of the things that you have built up, all of the facades that make up who you are were stripped away? What if you woke up tomorrow and you didn't have any arms or any legs? You weren't able to play the sports that you loved or the instruments that you cared about? What if your voice stopped working? Or what if you lost your ability to go to the school, to FIU, to your graduate program, whatever it is that you do? What if you woke up tomorrow and all those things stripped away? If you found yourself without the ability or positions that you normally cling to as your identity. What would your identity be then? For those of you who are here last week, you heard me begin to talk about my own journey, about my testimony and how I went from playing sports and the life that I lived to, to coming here at being a pastor at United Wesley. But one of the things that really changed my life and one of the biggest revelations I had that really took me from someone who was unhappy with life, trying to figure out my way, was that when I stopped playing football and I started going back into my life, I found out that I was going to have kind of a crazy experience. I found out as I was wrestling with this whole faith question that I was going to have to spend basically an entire year in a wheelchair. I went from being a football player at the University of Florida, winning a national championship, having everyone who knew me knew that I was the kid who had gold trophies and ribbons all over my room. All of these things that I did, all of the athletes and all of the people who knew me, everything I had built up was this identity around my ability as a sports athlete. And then suddenly, within the course of a few months, not only did I realize I would never play football again, but I also found myself not able to leave my own house because my mom would have to open the door and put the wheelchair over the ramps and down into the sidewalk. 
I found myself completely stripped away of everything that I thought made me, me. And I began to wrestle with this question of identity. And for me, it was that turning point. And as I wrestled over that year, as I was in a wheelchair, not able to do any of those things, that I truly began to start seeing the reality and the life that God offers us through the Bible and through scriptures. I started saying, who am I if I can't play football? Who am I if I can't do things for myself? And I came across this story, which is in Matthew chapter three. And it's actually in all four of the gospels in its own way, because this is the story of Jesus's baptism. And I'm gonna read this for you because in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says something that hit me so strongly. It said, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son. With him, I am well pleased. And now most of you, if you've grown up in church and you've done this a lot, you've heard this story so many times. We've heard the story of Jesus' baptism and heaven opening up and this beautiful dove coming down. And yeah, Jesus is God's son. Jesus fully is the Christ. But for whatever reason, when I was reading this that day, sitting in a wheelchair, not able to do anything, this thought hit my head. And I began to search the scriptures and I read all four of the stories of Jesus' baptism. And the story in John is, is more of John just talking about it. But what I found was this. Before Jesus had done anything else, before the wedding at Cana, before he started performing miracles, before he does any of the things that we often think about Jesus being, before he heals anyone, before he preaches about anything, God calls him his son, whom he loves. With him, he is well pleased. Before Jesus does absolutely anything that makes him Jesus in our minds, God's love covers him fully as his son. To me, that was crazy to think about. You see, in the story of Matthew, we have this crazy story about Jesus and his family going to Egypt when he was a baby so he wouldn't be killed. And in Luke, we hear that when Jesus was really young, he, he kind of got away from his parents and he stayed at the temple when he, when he was supposed to be with them. And, and that's all we know about Jesus's younger life. But what's remarkable to me about that is that all the things we think of when we think about Jesus besides his birth, they all happen after this moment. For me, this is so crucial because it means that everything that Jesus is about to do, everything he is about to say, everything he is about to take, teach and do for us and for all of humanity and all of time is rooted in the fact that Jesus is the beloved son already fully pleasing to God the Father before he has done anything that we in today's world would say gives him value. God sees Jesus as his beloved child simply because he is Jesus and he is his child. What's crazy about this is that as we read the Bible, it's not just about Jesus, but actually according to Paul, if we go to Romans chapter eight, verses 14 through 17, it says this, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption as children. And by Christ, we call Abba Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs. And if we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, that in order we may share in his glory. You see, Paul makes this bold claim that we actually see throughout the entire Bible that you and I, as people of God's spirit, who are led by God's spirit, are God's children, heirs and co-heirs with Christ to all of the glory, all of the life, all of the beauty that God offers us. But it doesn't even stop there. 
Like not only does God want us to know that we're God's children, that we're co-heirs with Christ, this insane idea, but from the very beginning of this Bible, from the very beginning of Genesis, we see in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, that God creates us in a special way. It says, then God said, let us make humankind in our image and according to the, our likeness, let them have dominion, let them have rain, let them have all of these things that we have created, the fish and the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, all of the food and the plants, all of the things that we have, let us give it to them to reign over. And it says in verse 27, so God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You and I are not only co-heirs with Christ, but we bear the very image of God simply by our creation. God created us each in God's own image, in the likeness of God we were created. At the core of who you are, if everything was taken away from you, if all of the things that you thought made you you, every accomplishment you had ever done, every talent and gift you have been given, which are beautiful and wonderful things, but if all of those things were stripped away and disappeared tomorrow, this would remain your core of being the image of God simply because you are God's creation as a human being, as a child, as a daughter, as a son of God. In God's very image, you were created. It is the core essence of our being. The truth is that you and I, being God's image, it brings up so many things. And it's part of the reason why we're doing this identity um, series kind of first after my testimony is because truly understanding our identity as God's image, as God's creation, is the foundation that allows us to live the Christian life to be faithful. And we're going to dive into that next week as we talk about God's purpose and, and what does it mean to be the God's image and bear that image to the world. But today I really want us to dive into this because when we look into the mirror, it is not just your reflection that you see, but it is a divine image being reflected at you. Just as, as we sit here and look on these Zoom calls and as you're sitting in classes or going to places and you see each other's faces, it is not simply the faces of our friends and family, but it is the actual divine image of God being reflected at you. God's diversity and creativity and power and love and beauty reflected in our creation and our being. See, the Bible makes this point over and over and over again. From Genesis to Deuteronomy, through the Psalms where God knows the number of hairs on our head, to the prophets where God calls us his holy people. From all the way from Matthew to John and all through the letters, you are God's child, you bear God's image, not because of anything you do, or anything you will do, not because of how many souls you will save for Jesus, not because of how great you can preach or pray or sing or do, not because of any of those things, but because of the simple fact that you are and because of who it is that created you. It is absolutely crucial to understand our identity because it is the foundation and roots of everything about our lives. When we forget or when we dismiss our identity rooted in the image of God as children of God, then we will easily be overcome by the hardships and temptations and problems of life. And isn't that exactly what happens to so many with us? We begin to discredit or attack our identity. We say things like, I'm so stupid, or I'm too fat, or I'm too short, I'm unlovable, I'm not enough. When we look in the mirror and tear ourselves down. And so I have no small mirrors in my entire house. So this is the only mirror I have and it's humongous. But when you look in this mirror, what do you see? See, a crazy study that I, I read many years ago and I wish I could put it down and remember it, but it said something that really changed my life this like 10 years ago. It said that the average American can't spend more than 30 seconds looking at themselves in the mirror 
Because when they do, when they look at their reflection, all they do is begin to tear themselves apart. They begin to not like themselves. And how many of us, if we're honest, when we're looking at the mirror, when we're thinking of ourselves, we start saying things that are not uplifting. Say, I am too fat, or I need to lose weight, or I am not good enough. I don't matter. I am too short. I, I'm never going to finish school. We say all of these things and, and what begins to happen is that although we can still see our reflection in the mirror, it be, starts to become clouded. And we start to, instead of seeing the divine image of God that's in front of us, we start seeing all of these labels and these problems that we put on ourselves. And the craziest thing to me about this is that I don't think it's a coincidence for us in today's world who ridicule ourselves, who hold ourselves to these beauty standards and all these things, both as males and as females, that we use the statements, I am, to attack ourselves. Because God, in the very beginning of the Bible, in the story of Exodus, God is before Moses and he's sending him to Egypt. And Moses asks him this important question. In Genesis 3, I mean in Exodus 3, verse 13, Moses says, God, who, who should I tell them you are? Who should I say is sending me to them? And God's answer in chapter 3, verse 14 is this. God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am sent you. God's very name is I am. And yet we, as God's very image, take that name in vain to attack and destroy and dismantle and degrade the image inside of us. The thing that God himself calls God's self, we use, instead of building ourselves up, we use to tear ourselves down. And by doing so, we forget our identity. We forget the roots and the core of who we are and who the Bible claims us to be and who the Spirit of God breathed its life into us to be. Because only once we start seeing ourselves as God's child, God's daughter, God's son, we start saying things like, I am God's image. I am loved. I am God's child. Only then can we begin to wipe away all of the lies and the put downs and the tear downs that others and ourselves have put on ourselves. For once we begin to live into the truth of our identity as Christ's image bearing children of God, we can start to see more clearly what God's will or purpose for our lives is which is exactly what we'll talk about next week. So would you pray with me? Heavenly God, Lord, I thank you that you have created us in your image. Lord, how crazy is that? How simple, but yet how difficult to wrap our minds around. Lord, I pray that as we go through this day and through this week, you put that into our hearts. Take these things that we read in the Bible or that we say we should believe or know is true and help us to start putting them into practice. Help us to start putting them into our hearts. Let us to start accepting the reality that when we look in the mirror, we don't just tear ourselves down or wish our hair or things were better, but we start acknowledging your very image and presence in our reflections, in the reflections of the people around us. Help us to see your image and to reflect your image everywhere we go. Because what a beautiful and amazing world it would be if we as your children lived in to our adoption, began to believe that we truly were heirs with Christ in your glory as we participate in your reflection here on earth. God, empower us to be your people. Help us to see who you've made us to be so that we can step out of the lives and the pains and the hardships that we deal with into the life that you promise us. We love you and we praise you. 
In Jesus' name, amen.